Welcome. This is the last class of the Berkeley online uh, master's class in studio design, which is one of 12 courses that Berkeley gives for their master's in audio production program. And um, there's about four or five out of the 13, I think, students in this class. Um, we meet every week for an hour, not to teach the class. The class is an online class, so that's rolled out every week in a pretty big curriculum. The goal is to design a studio, what a shock, and um, of which uh, the students that are here, Ronan, Alex, uh, Mercedes, hi Mercedes, how are you from Mexico? I'll talk Good, to you. How are you? And Layla, how are you? Um, Darren, Joey, these are students, everybody else, are from the WSDG universe in all kinds of capacities, and it's not necessary. We just invited them. And on the last week, since everybody has submitted their program, we usually try to have a bonus guest. In this case, we're going to have two guests, a returning guest, Eddie Kramer. I do not have to tell you who Eddie Kramer is. Um, you, you need to know that already, and if you didn't, you should. And then also Peter D'Antonio waving. And you should know his name also. He is sort of the godfather, or certainly one of the godfathers of diffusion and scattering um, in our world. So all those diffusers that you see in the back of control rooms, he's more or less the reason for them. I don't know whether to thank him or curse him, but we, we, <laughs> and but more importantly, he and Rinaldi waving from Brazil. Okay, are and a, and one or two other people. Our tour is also there are the sort of founding partners of this uh, Ready Acoustics program that has unpacked the software that you hear us refer to every now and then, and it's pretty advanced. Um, it's not something you can buy. We're still always developing it, but it's pretty cutting edge. <clears throat> Peter's going to present the sort of high level, high level 15 minute, not too much math overview of what this is about. And I thought you'd be pretty, pretty interested in it. Um, Eddie is a lifetime friend. He is the reason why I, why this path changed for me 52 years ago. I wanted to strangle him when he talked Jimi Hendrix into not using my club design. <clears throat> and then 10 seconds later, he seemed to say, well, why don't you just do a studio? Even after I reminded him that I'd never been in a studio. And I guess we've remained lifetime friends. He's my daughter's godfather. And, um, and of course, he and a, a number of a small, a relatively small group of engineers and producers have changed the world we live in. Uh, still working, still producing, lives in Canada with wife AJ and still works. So we're going to extend a little bit longer today. So, Eddie, I'm going to start the Q&A and then everybody you want to jump in, you got to jump in. It's, it's hard to get Eddie. And thank you for doing this a little earlier, Mr. K. I appreciate it. And, um, Okay. So let's just go right to the 500 pound gorilla, which is at immersive. Everybody calls it Atmos, but Atmos is a brand. Obviously, Dolby would like you it to become more than a brand. But let's stay with the brand. Let's stay with the generic word, which is immersive. Thoughts, thinking, doing it, not going to stick, going to stick. Who cares? Who gives a fuck? What's your? Let's go. Let's just say right to the 500 pound gorilla here. What do you think, Mr. Kramer? Well, when you're actually mixing in, in uh, Dolby Atmos, it can get very exciting. It's challenging. Which you have done, correct? We, we've been doing a bunch of it. And Mr. Hendricks was our first, um, I was going to say guinea pig, but that's probably wrong. Um, we just come out with a, a new album. It's called Jimi Hendrix at the LA Forum 1969. Now there was a stereo version of that, of course. And then at the last minute, this is a, a, about six, seven weeks, almost eight weeks ago, we got a call from Sony. Hey, uh, you, you got to put that stereo. You, can you do a Dolby Atmos mixer? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Bang. And then of course we go to Mark Studio, which is a studio John designed for my friend, Mark, who's, 20 minutes from my house here in Wellington. And the studio wasn't exactly 
finished, finished. I mean, it hasn't even been properly tested, but we did it. Uh, and one of the reasons why I think it was so successful, apart from the fact that, you know, John did a fabulous job and all the rest of them, the guys who put it together, it was pretty damn close to being right on. We received a signal, all 14 channels digitally from uh, a studio in Los Angeles with Chandler, my engineer out there. He was setting up the Dolby Atmos mix and we were receiving it in real time here in Canada. And it was amazing. Anytime I said, hey, I need 1dB at 10K broadband with blah, blah, blah. And he kicked that in and I could hear it immediately. There was a, the tran It translated beautifully. The bottom end needed a little bit more of an adjustment. Bottom line, it sounded fantastic. It really, it really did. The next thing that really shook me was, you know, we were talking about immersive. Um, binaural they have sony has their own 360 spatial whatever you want to call it version of it and i was listening with headphones you know turning the speakers down putting your phones on it and if it did not translate into the phones correctly we had to make adjustments back and forth so that there was a good compromise between the, the two systems what did you mix in you mixed in atmos and then hoped for a translation well it was more than a hope uh, everybody it was more a question of where Chandler has been working in Dolby Atmos for the last two and a half, three years at Capitol Studios. In fact, one of the one of our mixes we actually did from Capitol before it closed down. And he works with headphones most of the time. Then he takes it to the room, quote unquote, plays mm -hmm. it back to make sure that it's cool. Because not you can't always get into the, the you know, the, the Atmos rooms. Uh, and and it's really important that. If it sounds good in the headphones and sounds maybe even better on the speakers, you're in. And yeah. that's that's what that's how I did it. So Eddie, when you're talking Atmos, uh, are you talking 9.1.6 or what what version of that? Yeah, what are you what version? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's 9.1.6. Yeah. Okay. Well, I was just I was just down at Blackbird and and they have a crazy situation there with George. <laughs> Massenburg, they have an Atmos, it's, you're facing one direction, it's, there's Atmos ATC speakers, you turn around, there's another million Sony speakers. <laughs> so Sony has, Sony has their own version of, of, the, of, of, of an immersive audio. It drives me, Peter, you've hit upon this thing, it is driving me absolutely insane because it's presenting a lot of problems because sure. you're, you, they have. It's like going back to the old days when we had VHS versus. Yeah. It's, it's yeah. that kind of crazy thing. Mm -hmm. Why don't we all get together and make this one mm -hmm. system that we all agree upon is the way to go? But mm -hmm. uh, but Eddie, you're, yeah, I mean, you you voiced an opinion that everyone seems to be voicing. Yeah, I'm hearing that from a few people, but that's you can't. I mean, some people are going on the record, but I think most people are just dancing a little bit you got to be careful because it's really the transition from dolby atmos to headphones and then into uh, apple's spatial audio so you got another uh and yet a third yeah situation going on um so eddie what are you delivering you're delivering an atmos mix and then what are you sending to apple what are you sending to or are you not sending anything to apple we send our stems directly to Sony oh. once once the Atmos stuff is done and it, it goes to them and then they take they, they take it. that and they take our binaural mm -hmm. we've done our binaural mix and they do their thing to it. Um, it's it's yeah. not what we would like. And here's a further complication: what about the public? <laughs> You try to, I sort of, I went online for an hour and a half trying to find those mixes in binaural. It took you everywhere <laughs> except where you wanted to go to. And you'd have to only get a snippet. You'd get one song or two songs, but it took me almost an hour to get there. Why didn't I make it easy? Just, hello, you push this button, you go here, you go here, you pay your $2 or $5, whatever it is. Here's your album. Thank you very much. Uh-uh. 
Now it's going to take a long time because basically a lot of a lot of uh, producers are remixing existing recordings, <laughs> which is yeah, I mean, I, I, as, I, as you are right. Um, well, Eddie, how was it? I mean, we sort of have two universes of these remixes. One where the artist would be next to you, i.e., living, and then of course, obviously, in the case of Jimmy, the artist is not living. So, yeah. have you done both? Have you had a chance to remix a living artist working with you? No, not as yet. That that's coming. That's coming soon. But I just want to mention one thing: the show from the '69 um, live show. Yeah. Just the band. It's across. Here you go. There's your band, and then you pull the edges out, and then you here's your rear, yeah. and there's the ceilings, and then all the rest of the stuff. We actually had to go back in and remix parts of it because I felt that. The, the sides could be better. We learned as we were going along. Yeah. It's, in the end, it sounded great. Uh, we did a special show at Dolby Atmos Theater in Los Angeles in Hollywood. And we did one at Dolby Atmos Theater in London and the audience went nuts. It did absolutely sound great. The next stage was we've now started on actual studio recordings which makes it a lot easier, a lot nicer yeah. to be able yeah. to pull things up. Well, John, you were there in LA. and at I heard the one. It was fantastic. 5 yeah. So imagine taking that 5.1 surround sound and now top, bottom, sides, and really doing some crazy stuff. So I have another question, Eddie. Are you mixing from the perspective of an audience <laughs> to a performance, or are you mixing from the perspective of the listener being in the band? And this is a question that comes up all the time. I don't want to be in the band. <laughs> <laughs> I leave that to you. I want to be in the best seat in the house. Right. I want to be enveloped by the sound, which is the reason, like I said, why I went back in. I wanted to feel like all of the yeah. reflections were were coming and 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 surrounding me and making me feel like I'm part of that experience. No, yeah. no pun intended. I know, but I mean, when you're in a hall, I mean, the, the the sound system is so loud that you're you're getting very little back from the room, though. Except oh. this particular occasion, I have to say, the sound in that room was oh, so okay. amazing. Interesting. There were parts where Jimmy was playing so quietly, his dynamic range. I mean, he would play like the quietest thing you could ever imagine, and you mm. can hear the audience whispering and talking to each other. It was. Oh, really? fascinating it's a wow. really it's a it's a wonderful show i i can't recommend it enough <laughs> they got like a up at jazz and lincoln center where they just put a an atmos system in pretty nice sounding and um in a room that we did and they at, at dolby as i i guess dolby's part of it or they're giving them the gear or something i don't understand the whole business but they did give them some five mixes sort of their test reel and uh, one or two were relatively benign, not overly interesting. One was a mistake. I just was boring. But then there was an, what I believe is an unreleased Billie Eilish song. Ooh. And um, besides just liking Billie Eilish, which I do, and loving her lyrics. Um, and also, you know, her music is very thin. There's a lot of air, yeah. a lot of space, which is, of course, what I think, I mean, that, I guess that's the brother. I, I don't. And um, you could tell that this particular song was created with with um, uh, with a with the notion of putting sounds behind you and on top of you. In other words, it was it was conceived that way. It was meant to be played in a hall that had some kind of. And by the way, there are more and more halls being installed with immersive systems, which means we're going to need the content for it. And it was. I have to admit it was pretty cool. The other thing is I, Bobby Margoloff, who couldn't be here today, who sometimes I invite now, of course, Eddie knows him. And he also touched the stars and changed our world with those four great Stevie Wonder albums. Stevie, what I never realized until recently, Steve, for all of those albums, he mixed in quad. He recorded and tracked and mixed in quad. The room we built for him, in Los Angeles was a quad room, even though they knew that they would never release it in quad. It was never released in quad because they just couldn't, there was no release system, but he mixed it and heard it in quad. So he, so this is 
45, 50 years ago, Crazy. 40 years ago, he's thinking in terms of putting stuff behind them. So when Bobby got to remix the stems with Stevie next to him, unlike you haven't had that experience yet, Eddie, of a live artist next to you, they didn't have a problem making it immersive. It was sort of almost ready to go. Yeah. But um, can you tell us who that artist might be or that's uh, confidential stuff who you might work with, Eddie? Uh, I'll, I'll let you know when it happens. Okay, cool. Well, that'll be interesting because you had, I remember in Capitol, it was a, I asked you, it seems like you had a tremendous responsibility to figure out where Jimmy, Jimmy would want things. I mean, that's a heck of a responsibility. I have a quick story. If everybody has, has a minute here, I'm in the middle of mixing Electric Ladyland at the Wrecker plant in 1968. Uh, so you can imagine, obviously no computers. It's like a, maybe a 30, not even a 30 channel console. And we would rehearse, J Jimmy would sit next to me, we would mix together. And we would rehearse some of the trickier parts a couple of times before we actually printed it. So we're in the middle, I think it was Gypsy Eyes. Uh, we're in the middle of the mix. And now I always had a Variac, which is a, uh, a voltage controller for, an, an, which drove an amplifier, which drove the capstan of a tape machine. So, and I had three or four tape machines for the phasing, because obviously I've used a lot of phasing and delays and crap like that. So in the, we're in the middle of the mix and it's going great. And all of a sudden for the most, the briefest time, it was about maybe two seconds, maybe it was even three seconds. All of a sudden, out of nowhere, Jimmy's guitar went like this, woof, right behind our heads. And I looked at Jimmy and Jimmy looked at me and we went, what the hell was that? He said, can you, hey man, can you do that again? I said, <laughs> I don't know. It was an accident, you know, because at that point, you know, when you're dealing with phase and different tape machines at different speeds, who the hell know what happened? But I know he was so intrigued by that, that if he were alive, he would be saying, hey, Kramer, pan that guitar over here, please. Cool. Well, still a tremendous responsibility. Yeah. Um, it's just hard to imagine on a different note that people are going to have to now buy 16 speakers. Yeah, well, they're not going to buy 16 speakers. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I believe this immersive experience will stick. I It occurred to me about two years ago when a company Bob was working with, I, I don't, showed at least a demo that you could have an immersive experience through through earbuds without any extra equipment. And when I heard that, I remember walking out of the room saying, this is going to stick. Yeah. You're not going to get Susan question. Homemaker to put in 16 speakers. I mean, some people will do it, but. Well, I mean, many of the, many of the recording studios in Nashville. Have <clears throat> the studios are going to have to do it. Studios will do it. I mean, they're yeah. defaulting to, to uh, dot four, just four in the ceiling rather than six. Yeah. Well, <laughs> for the smaller rooms. Yeah. Cool. I just had a call yesterday, Somebody actually. Um, yeah, sorry, Will from WSDG. Hey, sorry, I hopped on late, but just related to this, I just had a call yesterday, actually, from a client. Uh, we're in the process of building a studio down in Atlanta. Um, framing's done, infrastructure's done. We're getting ready to close up, and he was like, you're going to kill me, but <laughs> I want to, can we make Studio B Atmos? <laughs> I'm like, sure, we can. Oh, sorry, I myself, but... Yeah, I'm actually um, in the process. Uh, this Hi, is, um, hey, um, yeah, um, Professor Rook, I'm sure, I'm sure you um, predicted me having at least one question on this. I'll try to, I'll try to keep, I'll try to limit my. I'm actually um, working on um, finalizing a 714 room at the community college that I work at in California, and. Um, I guess like me, yeah, my question for you, having done a lot of like these mixes, because for me, like I first was only listening to binaural mixes and headphones, then we finally got this room going and I was actually able to hear like a true um, immersive audio mm -hmm. multi-channel. And so now binaural just kind of sounds like a, a cop out to me. It just sounds so <laughs> like, it just sounds so cheap, but I know that like, unless I unless you physically bring someone into one of these rooms that's what they are going to 
that's that's kind of the height of what they can perceive it to be. So, um, yeah, Mr. Kramer, I know you said that you um, were kind of going back and forth between like headphones for the binaural and then being in the actual um, room. And I was just wondering, um, yeah, how much of a compromise do you have to make in those situations? Because I guess it's always been with that with kind of knowing that like you're in a better room mixing than people are going to be. But this is an old it. conversation. People oh, for yeah. years have asked, why don't we mix in headphones? Why I, do I, we need the room? I, hate, I mean, I, I don't like headphones the best of time. I will say, though, that mm -hmm. listening to binaural was the best headphone experience I've ever had. Mm -hmm. However, let's look at the oh. numbers. If there's now 8 billion people on the planet. Four are listening in buds. <laughs> I know more. I believe it's more like five or six yeah. billion people are using some form of ear, earphone, headphones, in ears, whatever buds. And that's the markets. If the record companies in their infinite wisdom can figure out, okay, let's try to put our heads together instead of fighting each other, come up with, like I said earlier, some kind of system that we can all agree to is this is the best way we can present it. That would be nice. Yeah, sadly, it, they- It is a, it's a compromise, whatever way you look at it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I guess like, yeah, if I, I'll limit my list down to just like one other question, but um, cause I, the warm, the room I work in is, yeah, it's a studio boom at a, a community college in Northern California. So it's, not the most high end thing, but we're doing um, the most we can with the space that we have. And I'm just, I'm just wondering, um, what do you see as being like the most ideal constant? Like what sort of feature, like if you could name like top three features that you think should be of the utmost quality in every room that you work in, what would you say? <laughs> Great speakers, first of all, no questions asked. I mean, ATCs for me, that's it. Not everybody can afford ATC speakers, but you, then you come down to the next level of speakers. I mean, John uh, and Peter, you, can you guys talk about that situation? Because yeah, accurate frequency response, particularly. particularly yeah, I mean, actually, we're, it's a pretty good segue into what Peter's mm -hmm. going to share with you and the mission that we've been on. I mean, the idea. The room is, you're not, to, you know, in a, in a perfect world, the room is as neutral as possible, potentially with a signature of some sort, but generally speaking, neutral. This is, this is inherently difficult to do um, and, and, um, and still keep a presence, a musicality, aka reverberation or decay rate, reasonable. And so, this I believe this is the mission that everybody's been on, and and certainly we've been on it forever, mostly intuitively with tools, and now even better tools. And we're going to share with you the tool we've been using. After that, it's up to every producer and engineer and artist to make the changes they want to make at an art at an artistic level. Um, more so now than ever before, because. The proof in the pudding, it, it occurred to me a few Grammys ago, I think, I don't know, they announced, you know, best record of the year and 17 people go on stage. What does that tell you? <laughs> it tells you, look at the records, they're being made in 15 different studios by 27 different authors. I mean, it's, there's, I, I don't want to get into that conversation, but that is in fact what's happening. So as this stuff, as the content moves around from room to room to room, we have an even higher expectation Okay, that there's some correlation from room to room to room, even if it's not, even if one person is working on the whole album, even you, Eddie, are working in two different rooms. It's being done in one room, being mixed in another room, maybe it's being rehearsed in a, in a third room. So you, you know that experience and you have an expectation that there's some neutrality in the response of these rooms so that you can then go do whatever you want. I've, it's, it's basic. I mean, let's take something as, as simple as an early reflection causing comb filtering. This is a pretty, well, it's so easy that most people get it wrong, but it's a pretty easy concept to see and measure. And as I told people, it's basically flanging. I think flanging is terrific. And certainly it's an honor to be, I mean, uh, look at Eddie, you almost invented it or you and a few people invented it. 
but I don't think your room should be doing the flanging. You want flanging, you don't want the room to do it without your permission. Okay. You want flanging, go ahead and run tape down the corridor or aim a trumpet. Uh, Tommy Dowd used to do that all the time. He'd aim his instruments a little bit into a window so he'd get a reflection back. Four or five milliseconds later, he shared this trick with me. Uh, and I'm sure, Eddie, you have, in, in days past, you had your flanging tricks. Now you maybe might do it digitally. But you'd be pretty pissed off if the room did it without your permission. That's just not what you want. So the path is the same, Lila. It got a little more complicated because there's more speakers. But it didn't actually get more complicated at the low end from Schroeder and down. Same issue, which is why our, our software started as a, as a Schroeder and down experiment, because we just realized that the tools that were on the market were not doing what they should be doing for us. Now we've expanded it to full frequency. Peter, maybe we'll touch on that, but same issue. I, as far as room design and room characterization, I don't think anything's changed. I think the mission is exactly the same. It just got a little more complicated. That's that's my thinking. Unless someone, I'm ready to have somebody else rephrase it. But I believe, believe I believe that. And then of course there's everything else that goes on in rooms, like building codes and budgets and air conditioning, lighting and quietness and vibe. Hello, vibe. Mm -hmm. Remember, they're supposed to be cool. Yeah, that definitely makes sense. And it's definitely been my experience so far going from yeah. just a 5.1 to a 7.14 is this hasn't been any more other like, yeah, yeah, the philosophy's never changed. It's just been uh, every time you, it's just been same thinking, different, different craning of your neck. So Eddie, your final product has now come out of a live room or you're still working across this audio movers platform that you like to use? Um, yeah, it is audio movers and Zoom and all of that. Um, but I think the next couple will be directly out in uh, Wellington at Mark Studio and in his room, right. which is where we can't wait to get the final <laughs> blessing. What, Peter, what, you, you, I'm I'm dying to hear what Peter has to say. Well, does anybody uh, I got a let's anybody got another universe they want to Eddie might have to bet, uh, book off before we're done. I don't know whether you I, I'm very respectful of your time and AJ's time. That's his wife. So anybody have want to throw another I'm, something I'm across about Eddie Darren? Yeah, I mean, just what I'm sure this is the number one question you get, but just the disposition, the style of which Jimmy would sit next to you in the studio, you know, like what, what's it like sitting next to him? What was it like? <laughs> what was it like? Unbelievable. <laughs> Short answer. Um, you know, from the very beginning, from when I first met him in January, late January of 67 at Olympic, there was a back and forth between the two of us as I, <clears throat> I'm standing in front of his amp and I bent down, moved a few mics and he'd been sitting in the corner. He'd never been in the studio before. It was very cold. He was, had the shirt <clears throat> on. I was about to move a mic and he came over to the amp, turned it on and hit a chord and my life changed in a nanosecond. I mean, hearing that sound of his guitar through the amp was just mind blowing. And then I, quickly had to figure out how the hell am I going to record this guy and I just went into overdrive to try to figure out mic positions how to sound in the room Brian ran into the control room got stuff together and we once he came into the control room to hear what I'd done quickly he looked at me and was like uh-huh and he ran back out in the studio and check this out man and then it was like a game he tried to up and then we try to top each other until we found each other on the same plane and we could he knew that I could satisfy him and his curiosity because I always wanted to make his sound different and 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 better and bigger and whatever I could use the primitive things delay compression EQ reverb that's all I had so having him with 
through, through that whole period, all the way up through Electric Ladyland and into 1970, when we were Electric Lady Studios, we were always sitting together at the board. It was a unity of the two of us. And, you know, I had to think like he was thinking. And that's very tricky because trying to be a couple of steps ahead of Hendrix is just, <laughs> no, you can't really. But it, it was instinctual. We, we enjoyed working together. That's, that's the bottom line. Thank you. And Penning, too. Right. Yeah, I'm afraid that's, I'm, I'm cursed with that, yes. <laughs> well, um, three or four artists you like listening to right now, Eddie? I'm going to throw that out. We have, no one's ever asked you that, but I, who, who are you listening to? You, you just mentioned, I mean, she is so good. I just love her. You know, I, the, the fact that, you know, she and her brother had done that in their bedrooms on primitive equipment, and here they are doing you know, Dolby Atmos mixes, and they created the sound together, the two of them. I think Billie Eilish is absolutely phenomenal of contemporary artists. And there's, you know, there's a there's some great new rock folks out there, but I don't know. There's 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 still this idea in my head that's some of it's the same, a little bit better, possibly, but I don't know. I don't want to get into <laughs> no, it's I I think I want to leave that alone. Yeah. All right. Fair enough. Again, no introduction required for Peter. Peter and Rinaldi, myself, uh, another gentleman that's not here, PK. Uh, he's on a plane actually. Um this started out, this, this adventure started out, correct me if I'm wrong, Rinaldi, it started out as an intern project in our office, right? Yes. Sort of. Little did I know that this was going to take us into a, a, a black hole. Uh, that's on a good day. It's a black hole <laughs> um, of uh, quite an adventure um, in um, essentially a predictive, an acoustic predictive tool, which is which is what this software is. Our adventure originally was to explore lots of different subjects, but we have now focused pr pretty much entirely on this software, which has a name, which is called Niro, and Peter will explain that to you. So I, I uh, started out as a low frequency analysis tool, and of course, we quickly realized that we should, <clears throat> why stop at Schroeder? Uh, why not, uh, Schroeder, well, let's go, on, <clears throat> let's go full frequency. So. Peter, I hand this over to you. Let's see. I'm going to have to give you permission to share a screen. Uh, how do I do this? Uh, one second. I'm going to. OK, so thanks for jumping in, Peter. OK, sure. Take some time out. So um, there you go. Can you see my screen? We see the universe, all your desktop. Oh. Is... Solar system. Solar system. Hey, back to the solar system. Uh, <clears throat> it means I want to share my other screen. Yeah, you want to share the other screen. Yeah. <laughs> and there we are. Unless you're giving oh. an astronomy presentation. <laughs> Unfortunately, I've been known to give too many of those crazy ones. But anyway, so uh, <clears throat> these are the uh, talented people that we have on the ready team and their names are at the top. And uh, I'm just going to zip through uh, what this non cuboid <coughs> room optimizer is. So for some about. of you who don't know Peter well, he's, in addition to all <laughs> of his other skills, he's um, an acronym master. <laughs> uh, loves acronyms. We, in fact, within minutes, if we don't have an acronym on a, on a project, we just don't do it. So <laughs> Niro is as you saw, a non-cuboid iterative room optimizer. And uh... so, so the thing is, um, <clears throat> scientists use what are called boundary conditions to solve problems. And I'm trying to give you some perspective as to uh, why we are looking at these types of rooms. And so <clears throat> many years ago, over three decades ago, I tried to come up with the design of a critical listening room. And I wanted to use some aspect of an anechoic chamber and a reverberation chamber. Anechoic chamber has no reflections or minor reflections. <clears throat> reverberation 
chamber has the usual early reflections and reverberant tail. And so in a large room, you have what is called an initial time delay. That's because it takes a sound uh, some time to reach the listeners from the side walls. But you don't have that luxury in a small room. Um, because in a small room, you have these early reflections and you have very sparse late reflections uh, in the room. And so in order to <clears throat> uh, embed some of these elements of both ex extremes, created a reflection-free zone which minimized these reflections and a diffuse field zone uh, <clears throat> which was created with reflection phase grading diffusers. And so we have this design of a room which has been around for a long time uh, and it has a, a good direct sound, a, a controlled reflection-free zone, and a nice linear uh, diffuse field zone. It's linear in dB, but it's exponentially uh, decaying in time. So, and this is what, uh, what John and everybody were touching on. What is the purpose of this control room? Well, it's a control room. And the, the main purpose of it is that what you do in this room is transferable to all the other listening environments that were alluded to. And so, you know, in, com in coming up with these acronyms, which hopefully stick, uh, you can listen to the music and not the room. And if you really can't take the room out of the mix, you can't take the mix out of the room because what you're hearing in a different room is the opposite of what exists in the control room. If the room is bassy, if the control room is bassy, it's going to be thin in another room. If it's brittle in the control room, it's going to be less brittle <clears throat> outside the room. So we want to minimize, as John was saying, all forms of acoustical distortion. And I'm not going to go through what they all are, but we'll begin with a traditional dimensional ratio analysis, which is how people usually approach uh, the low frequencies in these rooms. <clears throat> and then we'll discuss uh, the effects of Nero. So <clears throat> we're going to start with a, a traditionally accepted dimensional ratio. And dimensional ratios just simply means you divide the width and the length by the height. And so the height is one, and the width is, is in this case, 1.4, and the length is 1.9. Now, there are assumptions involved with doing this that often are ignored. Uh, they are that the room has to be cuboid, meaning the room has to have 90 degree angles. And the fact that the walls in this room have to be perfectly reflecting. And uh, in acoustics, we use the term uh, admittance, <clears throat> which is the, re the reciprocal of the complex impedance. That having been said, uh, it also assumes that all of the modes are heard and all of the modes are excited. And to create that in a room, you would typically put the speaker in one corner and put the listeners in the opposite diagonal corner. So all the modes are heard and all the modes are excited. And we're going to be using this simple, uh, simple equation, square root equation, in which this is the length, the width, and the height, and these are integers. And you can predict very accurately the position of the modes <clears throat> in a cuboid room. Uh, <clears throat> and so what we're doing here is we're comparing this simple prediction with, it, with a, uh, a wave acoustic model. And we're setting the admittance equal to zero, which is what happens uh, when the walls are perfectly reflecting. And as you can see, the speaker is in one corner and the listener is in the other. And so what we find when we do that accurate wave analysis, <clears throat> we get a very accurate prediction of the location of the modes, but we do not get a very accurate prediction of the intensity of the modes. See, these two are way up high. These are very different. And then we're going <clears> to <throat> progressively start to uh, model a real room. And so the first thing we'll do is we will uh, use an admittance, which we found out experimentally uh, by using a room at WSDG that we converted into a test chamber to come up with a value of the admittance of some value. And you can see that <clears throat> once you make the walls non-perfectly re reflective, the these sharp peaks tend to broaden out. And then we'll bring <clears throat> we'll bring the, the, <clears throat> the loudspeaker into the room at a normal position. And you see an even an even greater difference. And then we'll bring the listener into the room, which is here. And here's the loudspeaker. So the listener um, is because you want a symmetrical room uh, is usually right in the middle of the room, which can be a problem because now you are sitting at the null of the width mode. And so we well, have center of the room in one dimension in the width. 
Yeah. yeah. And so um, this is all well and good. It's a nice beginning approximation. But what, what this dimensional ratio doesn't account for is what we call the speaker boundary interference. So if you buy a loudspeaker, you get four for free because these four free virtual speakers <coughs> are essentially reflections from the room. And the problem with the speaker boundary interference is that it results in a very, dip, a very deep null at low frequencies. This is one wall, this is another wall. I assume you, you can see my mouse? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, and then if you have three walls, which we typically do in the corner, you get a very deep notch at a low frequency. Now, as you move this speaker into the dihedral corner or into the trihedral corner, you can move this notch up to higher frequencies, at which point it can be handled a little more easily with porous absorption. But it's something that we have to control in the Nero model. And uh, we can do that by windowing the impulse, response, <coughs> the impulse response that we get, because this is where all of the SBIR has its effect. Okay, so having said that, what are the wave-based and geometrical acoustic models that we use in Nero? Well, it's a nice chart that Rinaldi made, <coughs> where if you look below this, uh, what is called Schroeder frequency, which is the reverberation time over the volume square root thereof, uh, multiplied by a constant. And it's a tip, it's a frequency which differentiates between modes which are isolated and modes which are not very much isolated. And those are called normal modes. And so we treat that <clears throat> with a wave acoustic model. <clears throat> we started with a boundary element and now we're using a finite element model um, to verify how flat this frequency response is. Um, and then um, we also want to model uh, the contribution of the speaker boundary interference. And we do that all at once uh, in the low frequency region. Then <clears throat> to, to move above the Schroeder frequency to control the higher frequencies, we use a, an image source model, which essentially is um, basically taking the virtual sources that I showed you earlier and connecting them with the listening position. That allows you to identify the low order modes in the room because we're gonna have to, we're gonna have to treat this, uh, these lateral areas in the room to remove these reflections. And we also need to know where the reflections from the rear wall are coming in because that's where we need to put a diffuser. And we don't want to put the, the diffuser willy nilly in a place where there is no strong reflection that we have to diffuse. And then in order to, um, <clears throat> to determine the reverberation time, uh, which is another important metric, um, we use ray tracing, where we send thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands rays into the room and, uh, and e evaluate their effect on the reverberation time. Now, there's a very, very um, complicated challenge that we have, because what I'm showing you here is is the modal response, the pressure response at different frequencies in both uh, two views, this and a cutaway, that you can see it a little better. Here are the two loudspeakers typically in the listening position. And so the challenge is we have to find, for a given geometry of the room, we have to find the optimal locations for the loudspeakers and the listeners. And those locations are where the pressure is uh, uniform between the extremes, between the modal emphasis and the depth of the nulls. So you can really imagine uh, that's a real challenge. It's like walking through a minefield of different pressures. And that can really only be done with a, um, an iterative um, uh, type of analysis. And, and we use something called the genetic algorithm. Uh, so that's the challenge. <clears throat> and then, how do we actually do it? Well, the first thing we do is we use complex impedances for the admittances of the wall boundaries. That's very important. Um, we want to simultaneously, because they're interrelated, optimize the geometry of the point out that these that getting these admittance values are not that easy. No. It's been a challenge. And that's that's something that we haven't talked about, John, but <laughs> I, I was talking with Michael Forlander at, at the national meeting. 
And we may have a, a project with the National Research Council in Canada, where in addition to them measuring the STC values of their wall partitions, uh, we're going to also be getting the complex admittance of the wall partitions. So that, that's an ongoing, uh, very exciting uh, research project. And of course, uh, we use a, a finite element model, which I'll describe in a minute. And then we use the image source model and ray tracing. Um, and then we combine these two models uh, to get an impulse response that we could actually listen to. Uh, we apply acoustical materials to optimize uh, <clears throat> what we get from the purely geometrical analysis. And the major goal of the geometrical analysis is minimizing the dips in the frequency response because they, it's very difficult to, to uh, equalize the dips. So we want to minimize the dips and having peaks in the response, we can always tame down with acoustical treatment. So this is what a finite element looks like. You, uh, you uh, create uh, <clears throat> a, a, an element model of the boundary as well as the internal contents as, as in, in terms of the, uh, the volume of the room and the internal contents, the absorbers and whatever else we can model. And there are some things in these rooms that we can't model. We can't model consoles really that well. We can't model um, sofas and other objects that are typically in rooms. So there's a little bit of a, a challenge there. And <clears throat> without just ignoring the left side of this plot, what we want to do is first off, optimize the geometry and the positions. And so what we do is an iterative analysis. You can see the room geometry changing and you can see the location of these early reflections changing. And so what we want to do is to um, optimize or get, obtain the flattest frequency response with the lowest dips, not only at the listening position, the mixed position, but also over a, a, a spatial average in the room because the mixing engineer, Eddie doesn't sit in a, in a neck vise when he's mixing. So, you know, mm -hmm. there's movement. Then there's also typically uh, somebody sitting next to you, like the famous Mr. Hendricks or at a producer location or and then the people in the back of the room sitting on a couch. Um, so those are the things we have to optimize with the geometry. Uh, we optimize the, the frequency response, the dark line, as well as the light blue line, which is the spatial average, and also the number of reflections in the, um, in the reflection free zone. So for example, we can, as we angle the walls, and if the walls are large enough, we can direct those specular reflections away from the listening position. So then once we've done that <clears throat> and we're satisfied, then we have to apply acoustical treatment to improve upon that response. And <clears throat> the way we do that, there is a theoretical calculation, a transfer matrix model that we can calculate the low frequency response of a low frequency absorber, whether it be a Helmholtz resonator or a membrane uh, and some other types that we are getting closer and closer to uh, creating or, or uh, developing. And so the, uh, we can compare the, the prediction which is the blue line with an experimental measurement in a very large impedance tube. It's a seven ton impedance tube that's 24 feet long. It's a two by four tube. So we, 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 we predict the performance of the resonator. We build it, we put it in the tube. We measure three impulse responses and do some mathematics and we get uh, this, uh, uh, this uh, 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 absorption coefficient. <coughs> and we also get the complex impedance, which we, is what we have to use in the model. Uh, and then if we want to get more information about porous absorbers or other treatment, we have a large a large rev room, which measures between 100 Hertz and 5,000 Hertz. And I have, uh, I have a, a full frequency impedance tube that you see behind me underneath the guitar, uh, which uh, is, a, is a, a square tube, six inches by six inches, and we can measure from 63 hertz to, uh, to 4,000 hertz. So we can we can measure other devices, you know, uh, Helmholtz resonators, porous absorbers. We can also measure fabrics. We can measure the transmissibility of a fabric um, because a lot of these projects, people are putting fabrics on top of these treatments. 
So when all is said and done, what we wind up with is an untreated room that we have optimized to the best of our capability, minimizing the nulls, as I mentioned. And we want to look at, um, uh, excuse me, but I don't remember who asked the question, what are the, what are the, the major items that you want to optimize? So they are the frequency response, the spatial average, the decay time. So as, as, uh, as sound decays in a room, you want it to, you want it to decay, equal, decay equally. You don't want certain frequencies to be ringing. And that's what you're seeing here. So this is an untreated room. And so you're seeing this frequency ringing and typically you're getting ringing at these lower frequencies. And so you have all of these problematic uh, ringing frequencies that we don't wanna have. And you have a reverberation time that is not acceptable. Uh, both in the low frequency and in the higher frequencies. And so at the end of the analysis, and this is sort of a, a drawing of the acoustical treatment that is used in the room and the geometry, uh, you see that the original room had uh, this, this dashed line, as you see up here. And so we have flattened that out uh, as best we can with the acoustical treatment within always the architectural constraints. Uh, you know, there's a window, there's an air conditioner, there's a, what have you. Uh, and so you can see that we now, and you'll see some examples in the real world, we actually have uh, created a room that has a uniform decay time. So when that bass drum hits, it doesn't go boing, it just goes thud. Uh, and of course, we have now a reverberation time in the room, which is suitable to the room, you know, typically three tenths of a second or thereabouts. And uh, we then, as I mentioned, combine the, uh, the FEM model uh, with, the, uh, with the geometrical model. We cross that over in frequency as you would in a loudspeaker and uh, take the Fourier transform of the app to get an impulse response. And then I'm not gonna play these for you, but we now have the capability of listening and there's uh, Billie Eilish. We can now listen to uh, a pre-recorded track uh, before the, uh, Nero optimization and after the Nero optimization. Uh, this is the Royal song before and after and uh, Josie by Steely Dan before and after. Uh, and you, you, you have to listen over headphones uh, for, for an accurate evaluation. But we're combining you know, the FEM model here with the ray tracing model. And then we apply head related transfer functions, uh, which are, uh, which are uh, frequency responses related to the what the pinna does, these ear flaps do, uh, which gives you a sense of, of directionality. Okay, so uh, our first proof of concept was in a room <laughs> at WSDG, it was an old storage room, and they stiffened up the walls, and I don't believe we modeled the doors. We did the best we could in this room, put a speaker in one corner, a microphone in and the we other. assumed it in, in an admittance of zero. Did we assume zero? I can't remember what we did. Rinaldi might remember. What it was we pretty stiff. It was. It was pretty stiff. Well, two two of the walls were ten inches of concrete. I mean, they, yeah. they were stiff, and then we just threw as many layers on until it wasn't possible. We didn't have screws anymore. It was pretty stiff. And and yeah. we were all and we were all uh, you know really excited. It was uh, champagne time. You know the yeah, that's what's... the prediction and the measurement were you know pretty dead on. I remember exactly where I was when I saw this. My first reaction was somebody's cheating <laughs> because this took a while to get to this. I mean, this is, yeah. we're now, we're now in the black hole. Thank you, Rinaldi. <laughs> and we're like, and finally, you know, the first moment where, wait a second, what we're saying would happen is actually what's happening in this room. Well, that's pretty cool. And I really thought, I think we all thought maybe the data was wrong. But it wasn't. Turns out it wasn't. Yeah, gotta yeah, believe. It cool. <laughs> so I, I'll, I can actually turn it over to John now. Uh, uh, we we probably have uh, how many projects? We're only about ninety. Yeah, they're yeah. in they're in a wide variety of stages. Some of the projects are not going to get built, but with many of them are now built. Ruboye, Sony, uh, uh, the RCA. Uh, uh, Sony HQ, um, the studio where Eddie's now working on. Um, 
This is Rob Jasko's studio up in his house uh, at uh, called Abbott Road. And we, we have enough now built to see that we're, that this is actually really, really working for us. Um, I think you can imagine, uh, yeah. just to John, chime in a minute, John, how difficult huh. the geometry of this room is to mesh. And, and and then again, not accounting for sofas and pinball machines and drum sets and yeah, <laughs> and but we still have a ways to go. I mean, we're right now we're we have an iterative moment for the for the geometry. Um, the 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 treatments are not iterative. They are basically we see the modes, we see the pressure, and we take very good guesses. I would they're really not even guesses. They're, we make a very intelligent solutions, place them, and then model. So of course the holy grail is that that's done iteratively, and we're working on it. So now it's a full frequency analysis tool, and then of course we're in the beginning, actually past the beginning stages of of really accurate oralization. This is Ruboye mixed with the master studio, which now is called Ruboye, and um, this is really our really <clears throat> at this moment the most famous studio and we've i mean you know the fir their first client was jack antonoff he said it was he hadn't been in one of the three best rooms he's ever worked in and that was kind of i mean just to hear that was nice but more importantly it the room is trans the room is is doing what we said it was going to do and this was very also a pretty complicated room not easy um, I if I could chime in one more time. This room, <clears throat> Raleigh, why don't you speak to this? This room uses um, a lot of subwoofers. And they're... That's another thing is, is how we're using subs to, to what help. What we found that, you know, sometimes when you're constrained in the geometry, uh, you can place uh, subwoofers up high. Raleigh, why don't you describe that? Yeah, this room has the interesting characteristic that it has an audience. Right. It has a large audience because it's also a classroom. So uh, the large largest problem was getting a good bass response in the back room and in the mix at the same time. Uh, and what we find out in some projects is that if we do a clever sub arrangement, uh, leaving sometimes one or of the two subs below the big speakers in the front, and then we add two, uh, one or two subs behind, either on the ceiling or on the floor, uh, Sometimes we can get a very even distribution of low frequencies up to like 80 hertz, where it's just a very even pressure field. Yeah. Uh, and this is what we've done for this room, and uh, it's allegedly sounding great. So that's a, that's a really big win to see that like that is something that we researched about. We found uh, limited resources as far as how it worked, but in in practice, it's good to see it working. So the other uh, beautiful result is that <clears throat> they have a console on an elevator. Uh -huh. And uh, the platform that the elevator is sitting on. There it is. <laughs> is perforated. And, and so we have probably the deepest Helmholtz resonator known to me. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. And, uh, uh, and the, 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 the benefit of that is when I when when I show you the frequency response, you can you can see how low in frequency we are getting a flat response. Uh, yeah, so these are this these are impressive graphs. Yeah. So this is the left and the right simulation. You want to talk about this, Renali? Yeah, that is that is our uh, left and right simulation between uh, comparison with measurements versus simulation. So. I think the blue line up top is the measurement and the orange is the simulation. So it's good to see that it's getting pretty yeah. close there. Uh, the line below is our error. This is just uh, a difference each between frequency. The yeah. And, uh, and so, so now look at this. This is the temporal decay. This, yeah. I mean, you can't get a flatter temporal decay. <laughs> Yeah, and this is the same deal as before. So top row is simulation, it's, bottom it's, row is is measurement. It's not the first time we've put a Helmholtz in a floor. We we've done it. We actually at at, um, at the church. We in the front of the console. We we had a, a cavity that we yeah. used, but it is the first time we've put it in a moving 
console platform, that's for sure. <laughs> how deep was this? This how deep was the uh, hole, Ronaldo? I think it's one point three meters. Yeah, it's pretty it's deep enough to hold the console. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and you might ask why they're they're yeah, doing right. this. Actually, it's I got. I'm gonna at Nam. It's it's on my talk. How do you make a 500 square foot control room become a 500 square foot live room? <laughs> this is how you do it. They when you look at the whole floor plan, they from time to time want to take that room and make it the live room for another one of their studios. And um, not my idea. It was their idea. We just took advantage of it. Yeah. By the way, not so easy to do. The wire management was a little weird. Yeah. Uh, so the last thing is this is this is a typical report that we create and these are all the acoustical treatments and <clears throat> enumerated where they are in the drawing what they are what their coefficients of absorption are and then <clears throat> and then this is the the reflection free zone so i remember I mentioned earlier that an anechoic chamber has reflections 30 dB down. So uh, we we have really realized what I showed you on the first slide where the reflection free zone, which is this line here, this is in the simulation, is 30 dB down from the direct sound. Um, and in, in the actual room, because we didn't model all of the racks that you saw on the sides and whatever else they have in the room, it's still very close, you know, maybe 26 dB down, which is perfectly well. And this is when the, the rear wall kicks in. Mm -hmm. And we have one of the largest, um, I, I don't have- Go Back uh, in the pick in the slides. Yeah, it's a pretty large diffractal. It's a large diffractal. Um, it, it's, 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 a, it's a third generation. It's hard to see uh, back here, but- um, yeah. It's the largest unit we've put in a room. Success. Remember, we talked about that. If you have diffusers inside diffusers, it's a diffractor. Yeah. I mean, the next challenge for us, we always have a challenge is how to model pieces of furniture. I mean, um, it's a challenge. So well, I'm excited about this boundary, this boundary experiment at national uh, at the NRC. Uh, oh, to get to get better admittances. To yeah, get admittances because we have the admittances for the. The acoustical treatment, we can measure that in the impedance tube. So if we get the rooms, if we get the, yeah. the boundary surfaces. I mean, we're yeah. taking good guesses. Yeah. But more and more, we're seeing designs where they're not using wall types that we're familiar with. Um, so. Yeah, because we get a lot of we get a lot of residential projects which are not, you know. Yeah, they're not stiff at all. They're not stiff at all, and you got to kind of make a guess at it. And, and they work in our favor because basically as that admittance gets worse or less stiff, it, it absorbs low frequency, but how much? Yeah. <laughs> so that's, yeah. Anyway, so, I- I just end with this. If you guys are interested in acoustics, I do a weekly educational LinkedIn page uh, that you're welcome to visit. And, uh, and then of course, Reddy has a LinkedIn page uh, as well as well as a website that you can go to. And that, that is the end.